Welcome to our first lesson in our ANSYS Innovation course on material elasticity. In this lesson, we'll be focused on defining some terms and diagrams related to material elasticity. Let's start with the definitions. We already defined stiffness in our introduction. It's a material's ability to resist elastic shape change when a force or load is applied. Now, elastic shape change is both non-permanent and reversible. This means that when I remove my force or load, my material will return to its original shape. But loads can be applied in many different directions. It's important to understand what mode of loading your material will experience. Often one mode will dominate, which can simplify engineering problems. Ties, such as those found in cables with suspension bridges, carry axial tension. Columns and bridges and buildings, they carry compression. Often columns such as this are hollow tubes rather than solid because tubes resist buckling more easily. Beams carry bending, such as those found in an airplane wing spar. Shafts carry torsion. An example of this is the drive shaft in a car. And finally, we have shells that carry internal pressures, such as those found in pressure vessels. In all of these examples, I'm applying a load to my material over some specific area. But what impact does this have on my material? And how can I visualize this using some common household objects? Let's take an example of a cube of material. The force is applied normal to the face of our cube. For the cube to maintain equilibrium, an equal but opposite force must be applied from the other side. The plane normal to the force, in our case the top and bottom faces of our cube, are carrying the force. If our planar cube face has some original area A0, the stress in our cube, notated by lowercase sigma, is equal to the force over the area A0. This has units of newtons per meter squared, or pascals. Now pascals are a really small amount. Atmospheric pressure is 1 to the 10 to the 5th newtons per meter squared. Because of this, we generally refer to stress in terms of megapascals, or meganewtons per meter squared, or newtons per millimeter squared. The case shown here with our cube, and often the most commonly discussed when first learning about mechanical properties, is tensile stress. This is what we see in our cable bridge ties, or more clearly, in a piece of elastic. Here I have a piece of elastic with a two centimeter portion blocked off in blue. If I attach a one pound weight to the bottom of this piece of elastic using a small clip, and then hang the piece of elastic by this one pound weight from my hand, we can see that the blue segment I highlighted has extended significantly. But when I remove this one pound weight from the bottom of my piece of elastic, it's returned to its normal size. This indicates an elastic shape change. What if we switch the direction of the force? This changes to a compressive stress, what we saw in our building columns. We can visualize this through squishing something, say, a marshmallow. As I apply the same one pound weight to the marshmallow, we can see it compress. When the weight's removed, the marshmallow springs back. Shear stress occurs when the force is parallel to the material surface. In this situation, I need three other forces to maintain equilibrium of my solid. Shear stress is located by lowercase tau and once again is our shear force F of S divided by A naught. A way to visualize this is with a deck of playing cards. If I place the palm of my hand on the top of the deck and slide my hand in the direction parallel to the tabletop, the cards slide in this slanted motion. This type of motion is indicative of shear stress. Our final stress state we will discuss is hydrostatic stress which occurs when an equal stress, either tensile or compressive, is applied to all surfaces of a solid. An example of this is our pressure vessel we saw earlier, or blowing up a balloon. As I apply some pressure to the entire surface of my balloon as I'm blowing it up, in this case with an electric pump, we can see the entire balloon expanding. Something to pay attention to with pressure is the sign, Pressure is positive when we are pushing on the surface of our material. In all of these stress cases, 
the shape of my material changed in some way. If we go back to our tensile case, we can see that the cube's side is some length L0. As I apply my tensile force, this length changes by some distance delta L. This is called strain, and it's a material's response to an applied stress. Strain is unitless. We can have tensile strain shown here. Compressive strain is calculated the exact same way, but delta L is negative. Shear strain we can visualize again with our deck of cards. We can see in this image that our cards have sheared some distance w compared to the original length here, l. So, shear strain is given by the tangent of gamma equal to w over l. Because shear strains are generally small, we can roughly equate this to gamma. Our final strain is hydrostatic strain which is called dilation, and this represents some volumetric strain within my material, given by the equation capital delta is equal to the change in volume over V. So we have our stress and our material's responding strain. These two are related, and I can plot them against one another on what's called a stress-strain curve. Original name, I know. Let's take our tensile case as an example. As I increase my stress, my strain also increases. Now, different materials respond to stress in different ways. Metals are often used as a case example. We see that there is some linear relationship between stress and strain at low strains. We enter some nonlinear region with a peak and finally have material failure. Ceramics, on the other hand, reach higher stresses at lower strains and then fail, while elastomers have a generally a nonlinear relationship between stress and strain, and can reach strains upwards of 100% or more before failure. While all materials react differently in the presence of stress, we can generally label three areas of our stress-strain curve. Our elastic behavior region at the beginning, then we enter some plastic region, where I have permanent deformation occurring, and finally material failure. Once again, metals as a case example fit this curve the best, but these three regions are important to consider for all materials when talking about mechanical behavior. As we said before, we're only interested in elastic behavior for this course. So let's zoom in on just the elastic region of our stress strain curve. As you can see, many different materials have a linear relationship between stress and strain at these low strain rates. This is called Hooke's Law and represents a region of our stress-strain curve where strain is recoverable. This means that when I remove my stress, I recover the strain as well, meaning that I have non-permanent deformation occurring. Hooke's Law can be represented mathematically as stress over strain. This is equal to Young's modulus, or E. If I'm thinking about stiffness in terms of designing a product, Young's modulus is a material property that I'll want to consider. This equation for Hooke's law, as well, of our, as well as our equations for stress and strain, can also be used in simple calculations. You can also calculate moduli for our shear and our hydrostatic cases. The shear modulus g is related to tau over gamma, and our bulk modulus k is related to pressure and dilation. Now I know we've covered a lot of different terms and diagrams, and we'll review them in a moment, but there's one more term that we need to define if we're talking about the fundamentals of mechanical properties and elasticity, and that's Poisson's ratio. When I was discussing tensile strain, some of you may have noticed I was only focused on the length change across the same axis as my applied stress. But if we take a look at our cube again and apply our force, we can see that the dimensions of my cube in the other two axes are also changing. Poisson's ratio helps us describe this change in the other two directions. If we're speaking about our tensile case, the other two directions contract. Poisson's ratio is given by lowercase nu and is the negative ratio of my transverse strain epsilon t divided by the strain of a tensile loading sample. Since our cube is contracting in the transverse direction, 
Poisson's ratio is a positive value, usually close to one-third. We did it. We got through defining different terms and diagrams related to material elasticity. Let's take a moment to summarize. I highly encourage you to use the guided note-taking sheet from our course webpage to help you keep the different terms, equations, and diagrams straight. We started by defining stiffness, which is a material's ability to resist elastic shape change when a force or load is applied. Remember, elastic shape change is non-permanent, meaning when I remove my force, my material will return to its original shape. We then defined five modes of loading, tensile, compressive, bending, torsion, and internal pressure. We saw that when I'm applying some force F to my material, I'm applying it over some initial area A0. F over A0 is defined as engineering stress. We learned about three different stress cases. We have tensile or compressive stress, notated by sigma, where my force is perpendicular to my initial area. We have shear stress, tau, where my force is parallel to my initial area. We have hydrostatic stress, or pressure, where I'm applying a force over the entire area of my material. Strain is the material's response to stress. Therefore, we have three strains corresponding to our three stress states. We have tensile or compressive strain, epsilon, shear strain, gamma, and hydrostatic strain. This is called dilation and represents a volumetric change rather than a length change. This is represented by capital delta. We can plot our stress strain values on a stress strain curve. This curve has three major regions. The elastic region, which is the focus of today's course, where I have non-permanent deformation occurring, the plastic region, where I have permanent deformation occurring, and material failure. Remember that when I'm looking at stress strain curves, I'm talking about a tensile sample. While other stress strain curves do exist, and many might look quite similar, the most commonly used example is a material that's being pulled in tension. If we zoom in on our elastic region, we notice that many materials follow a linear relationship between stress and strain. This is called Hooke's Law and represents where I have recoverable strain in my material. Hooke's Law can be represented mathematically as stress over strain equal to E or Young's modulus. Young's modulus is a crucial material property to consider when thinking about stiffness in materials. We also learned about the shear modulus G and our bulk modulus K. Finally, we defined Poisson's ratio, which we use to help consider the length change that's occurring on the other axes of my material where I'm not applying a force. In tensile cases, this value is positive and often close to one third. Feel free to go back in the video and pause to fill in any gaps in your note-taking sheet. Pay special attention to the equations and what units are required for them. Now that you're more familiar with the terms and equations related to elasticity, why don't you explore some of them with some simple problems? Homework can be found on the course webpage. To grade, simply enter your answers into the homework quiz for quick grading. A solutions video will also be available that will go through the math in more detail. Now that you've explored this lesson in the homework, you may be wondering, why do materials behave so differently in this elastic region? When we showed our stress strain curve, we saw that ceramics, metals, and polymers all behaved quite differently. Why? Lesson two in this course is focused on exactly that. It has to do with atomic bonding. The fundamentals of what hold materials together have a profound impact on their properties. Mechanical properties are no exception. So stick around and join me as we deep dive into the impacts of atomic bonding on elasticity.